Uh, my name's Ashley. I've been with Sony now for seven years um, as a tech rep or uh, as a digital imaging specialist. Uh, feel free to follow me on Instagram. Uh, my handle there is Zootographer. Uh, and there you'll see a lot of zoo photos, some macro photos, a lot of pictures of our dog, Hazel. Uh, but feel free to follow me there and you can reach out through there too if you have questions on anything. So let's jump right in. So I decided to kind of really dedicate and build this class during um, kind of some downtime we had during COVID. Uh, when everything was kind of locked down, we weren't really allowed to travel for work uh, and a lot of stuff just wasn't open. So as a photographer, I still wanted to get out and create and take pictures. And so for me, that was really uh, going out into the backyard and finding stuff. So a lot of the images that I'm going to kind of show you here is just different uh, kind of things through that, the kind of whole different worlds that open up based on some of this like close-up photography, this macro photography, uh, things that we would normally kind of overlook or not see. And that's also led me to one of my favorite combinations for macro photography, uh, which is a macro lens, a very sharp lens, a lens that allows you to get very close, but then also pairing this with a high megapixel camera. Because then we can take an image like this and we can look at a very small section of that image and actually pull up and see tons of detail in a very, very small portion of an image, pairing uh, the power of those macro lenses with a high resolution camera. Before we start kind of diving into everything tonight, uh, just some different resources for you guys. Uh, these are kind of the less fun uh, ones on the bottom here. Things like our e-support site, where you can go and get uh, firmware updates for your cameras, the full version of the manual, um, things like that. The nice thing with the manual uh, from the e-support site is it saves as a searchable PDF. So you can save it to your phone or a tablet. And then you can open it up while you're out in the field and actually search it really quick to find what you're looking for. So a very nice thing to have. I would recommend definitely downloading that and saving that on your phone or tablet. Um, up on the top, you're going to see alphauniverse.com. This is Sony's website. This is a great uh, resource as well for inspiration. There's a whole bunch of different tabs. Uh, one of them is under the community tab, I want to say. And it uh, has things like uh, what's in my bag and stuff like that. So you can actually see a bunch of different like macro photographers and they're going to show you the kit they take to go out and photograph macro. So this is nice because you can actually pick up some different ideas on uh, things that are not even camera gear related that they're bringing with them and why they're bringing those pieces with them. This is just a glimpse at the Alpha Universe site. Uh, like I said, I think it's under the Explore header. Uh, or the community header, one of those two. Uh, but it, you'll have that section, which is really fun. But then you'll also, under the community section, have a list of all of the different artisans. So all of our different uh, Sony-sponsored photographers and things like that. Uh, and you can actually uh, follow them and get inspiration as well. The Sony, access uh, Sony System Accessory Chart. It's a tongue twister there. Uh, this is kind of just a nice site. If I'm looking for an accessory for my camera, I can select which camera I own and it will show me all of the Sony accessories that work with my camera. Uh, so all the different microphones, different cables, flashes, uh, battery grip, all that stuff, whatever is meant to work on my camera, it will show me. Uh, everything else will kind of be grayed out. All right. So what we're going to talk about tonight uh, first, we're going to kind of define macro so that we're all kind of on the same page as to what macro is. We'll go over some different lens options that we have for macro photography as well. We're going to talk a little bit about controlling depth of field, uh, some different shooting techniques, uh, and then we'll go into some camera settings and then talking a little bit about composition as well. So first things first, what is macro photography? If we went on the internet and trusted what we read there, uh, you would find something like this, basically saying photographing 
an object extremely close to the camera's lens and imaging plane or sensor nowadays, uh, so that the size captured by the camera is life size. So this is a weird thing to read, but basically what it's saying is that if I was taking a picture of an object and I placed that object right on top of my imaging sensor. So if you think about the picture that you would get, if we uh, looked at our imaging sensor, full frame sensor is, oh, fairly, fairly good size. But if I set a quarter on top of that imaging sensor, that's how big it would be on my, my final picture. So if I sat that on a, my imaging sensor, it'd probably take about 50% or so of that imaging sensor. So that is what we mean when we say captured life size, not life size in terms of how I as a person view it, but as if it were just sitting right on top of my imaging sensor, how big it would be in my image. So that's a long-winded way of saying that if I'm looking at my scene and you can see my lens and I'm photographing this guy right here, so this teeny tiny little thing, my macro photography is capturing this. So again, an entirely different world than what I can normally see with my human eye. Because I walked by a bush and I didn't even realize that that was a spider until I saw it moving around. Went and grabbed a camera and everything, came back to him eating, I believe it's an ant. Uh, so very, very cool. But these worlds kind of open up in macro, uh, these little kind of unseen worlds that otherwise are kind of hidden, which is, I think, the thing I love most about macro is that I can walk by a common everyday object so many times uh, and then stop and photograph it with macro and it all of a sudden becomes something completely different. There we go. So a couple different images. Um, and a lot of what I'll probably talk about today is gonna be more so close-up photography. So not true macro, it's not one-to-one -one or not as the size it would be if I sat it right on my image sensor, but extreme close-up. So basically filling up my frame with my subject. So that could be things like bugs, that can be things like uh, wedding rings and whatnot if I'm a wedding photographer, or if I'm shooting product photography, I'm photographing jewelry, things like that. This can be some flowers. And again, just kind of all the other critters that we find in the backyard. So a lot of what we'll talk about today is going to be more close-up and macro, not just dedicated macro photography. But again, all the different worlds that kind of open up the textures that we normally don't see or the patterns we normally don't see uh, with our normal eye. So some of the things that will make your life as a macro photographer a lot easier uh, first thing is a tripod. I find that this helps quite a bit. You can pick up tripods that actually have an adjustable center column. And the benefit of this is that I can get my tripod either really low to the ground by removing that center column, but it also allows me to uh, basically relocate the camera, still sturdy and on a tripod, but now that center column can go um, completely horizontal and now I can shoot over top of things or straight down on things. So it gives you a lot more flexibility in that sense. If you are uh, one of the people who do not like carrying a tripod with you, um, and I don't blame you for that, another alternative is to uh, either get the little portable tripods, so little tiny kind of like platypod kind of things, or uh, they make beanbag tripods, which are really convenient as well. And the beanbag tripods, I can, you know, basically toss in a bag and it is almost not there. And then when I need it, I can screw it into the camera, set my camera down on the ground, get a nice low angle or a different angle. Light modifiers um, are another thing that I would recommend having, especially if you, um, for your close-up photography, macro photography, like to photograph flowers and you go to like the botanical garden, you know, a day, uh, like kind of like today where it was bright and sunny out all day, creates really, really harsh shadows on my subject. These little pop-up diffuser discs fold up super small, uh, maybe about the size of uh, like a dinner plate or even smaller than a dinner plate. But they can fold up that tiny. But then when I unfold them, they're usually like 36 inches across or 42 inches across. They end up being pretty big. 
And it allows me to really soften the light that's falling on my subject and diffuse that light. The added benefit is you can get some of these that are not just a translucent disc, but actually have uh, multiple, um, if you will say, reflective surfaces to them. So like a silver or a gold or a daylight. Uh, so you can get some that actually have multiple options and that unzips from the actual disc itself. The benefit of that is I can hold my diffusion disc to soften the light. I can take that cover that has like the gold or whatnot on it. And I can set that down on the ground underneath my subject. So the light that's getting through bounces off that gold, kind of kicks up this nice warm light onto my subject. And then the diffusion panel will soften the light that's coming onto my subject. So I get a nice even lighting, but also a little touch of warmth from that uh, reflector cover as well. But a light modifier is something I would always have with me too. Um, some sort of a flash or a light is also helpful. Um, just as we were talking about bright sunny day diffusing some of that light, sometimes I want to add a little bit more character or a little bit more drama to my subject using either a flash or some of the little uh, compact LED panels work really well for that. I can create the really dramatic lighting and add a lot more character to my subject. One thing I really like to do and uh, one thing we're going to try and mimic on Friday uh, is I like to photograph flowers, but I usually like to photograph them at the most in the middle of the winter when I don't have access to them all the time. So I buy flowers for my wife. I look like a great husband. And then I get to photograph those flowers in the kitchen uh, for usually a couple of days before they uh, start to wilt and all that stuff. So it allows me to photograph these flowers in my house, but using a flash, I can basically um, mitigate all the light in the room so all I'm seeing is the flash go off. And so even in my kitchen, it'll be a completely black backdrop. Uh, so it's a nice kind of feature that we can do there as well. Remotes are nice for macro photography. Again, anytime I can remove myself from the camera and remove that movement. Bunch of options from either setting a two second timer, using the mobile app or getting an actual cabled or wireless remote. Uh, but something I would have in the, in the camera bag um, an eyedropper or uh, like a misting bottle is kind of nice if you photograph flowers again. Uh, the eyedropper is nice because I can do little drops of water on the petal and again add a little bit more uh, character to the photo. I also like to make sure I have gaffer's tape. Uh, if you're not familiar with gaffer's tape, it is basically a fabric tape, but it doesn't leave a residue, but it's still strong and sticky. So the nice thing here is if I need to try and fix something in a pinch or I need to try and hold something in place, that gaffer's tape is a lifesaver. I don't necessarily want to carry a huge roll of this with me everywhere, though. So what I actually do is on my tripod, I wrap a bunch of this around the tripod leg. And then if I need it later, I can unwrap some of that and use it when I need to. And then the final piece. Uh, chip clips uh, or Bogan makes a thing that uh, is called a super clamp and has kind of like a bendy arm to it. But, uh, but I use these to hold some of the different flowers and things like that in place if I'm out in the field photographing. Uh, so taking my tripod leg, having it kind of closer to uh, some of the flowers and then using a chip clip or something like that to actually hold that uh, stem of the flower in place. So that way it's not swaying nearly as much. So little tricky things we can do like that. A couple different lens options that you'll have. Uh, these are in Sony, but almost every brand has typically two to three options, sometimes more. Uh, we're gonna start on the far right. If I had a crop sensor camera, so a 6000 series camera, the 30 millimeter macro is more of my like product photography lens. Uh, uh, this will allow me to get up close, uh, but to get my true like one-to-one -one kind of representation, I'm going to have to be very close to my subject. The 50 millimeter macro is a little bit higher quality glass, and it's designed for full frame. So it'll work on both crop sensor and full frame. It's a little bit brighter in terms of aperture or light gathering. Uh, and then it also moves me a little further from my subject, so I get a little bit more working distance as well. The 90 millimeter macro, also full frame, 2.8. It's much faster to focus. It's much sharper as well optically. 
and then being a 90 millimeter versus a 50 millimeter, I get a greater working distance. In terms of using something for close-up photography, uh, my favorite out of this whole group is the 100 to 400. Uh, I get about three feet away at 400 millimeters. So if I'm photographing things like uh, bugs or reptiles or frogs, things like that, um, I get a nice sharp image. I can still get very close, but it's not a true one-to-one -one macro kind of capability. Uh, but you also have a 70 to 300 millimeter option in full frame and a 70 to 350 millimeter in APS-C. Um, the 70 to 350, note that it's probably close, uh, yeah, three and a half feet. Uh, so it's a little further away that you have to be to um, get that close focus. When I'm talking about uh, working distance, so we're going to use the same camera in these examples. And I'm going to show you kind of an example image of how close I can get with each lens to give me the same photo. So this being the 90 millimeter macro, this being the 50 millimeter macro, and this being the 30 millimeter macro. So as kind of a nice side by side, you can see we can get the same image image with all of these, the difference is just how much closer I have to be to my subject to get it. So if I'm photographing product photography, uh, it may be not as big of a deal. But if I'm trying to photograph bees in the backyard, there's no way I'm, I'm doing that with that 30 millimeter macro, right? Because I'm going to be right on top of them. So depending on my subject, each lens has kind of a better purpose. Ideally, I would say the 90 macro is the way to go, just because you can stay a little further away from the subject. So I'm not going to cast a shadow on my frame as I'm trying to photograph it. Uh, and then also if I change subjects, maybe I'm photographing flowers and bugs today, but it's product tomorrow. Uh, it doesn't matter. I can do it all with that same lens. Most of the macro lenses will also have a range limiter on them. Uh, where I can tell it to work the full focal length of that lens, meaning uh, from infinity all the way to the nearest it can focus. So I have the ability to adjust this. Uh, if I was only doing macro, I can tell it only work in that half meter to, or I'm sorry, yeah, half meter to 0.28 meter, uh, if we're looking at the one on the right here, only work in that range. And then it'll only be in macro range. Or I can say, you know what, I'm going out and I'm shooting portraits today or senior photos today, but I want to use my 90 because it's a 2.8. Then I can also tell it, go from infinity to half a meter. So now it doesn't come all the way back to the close focus capability that the uh, macro does. It's just working on more of that normal range for me. And then full is going to be the whole range. So infinity to close focus. Any questions we need to tackle, Ed, or keep rolling? Keep on rolling. All right. So next we'll tackle uh, depth of field. This I find is usually the, um, the biggest struggle uh, a lot of us have when we start photographing macro. And it's that uh, our plane of focus gets incredibly narrow when we're photographing our subjects. So as I'm up close to this B, and you can see it on here, uh, how thin that depth of field is. So it starts to defocus about there and there. So if my subject moves even just a little bit further back or a little bit closer to me, they're going to start falling out of that plane of focus right away. So this happens because as, as we get super close to our subject, that depth of field shrinks just the same way as if I open my aperture up to a 2.8 versus an f11. So two ways we can overcome depth of field. Uh, and this is kind of an example of how shallow this gets to. So these are those bees I showed earlier, kind of playing around on the flowers in our backyard. Right now, he's sharp and in focus. But as he lifts off, he very quickly goes out of focus as soon as he moves even an inch in either direction. He 
starts to get kind of soft and fall out of focus. And it's just because that depth of field is so razor thin. So option one, I can use my aperture. If I shoot at a 2.8, again, it's going to be super narrow. Uh, so I have to be very particular on either where I'm focusing or how I align myself to my subject so that I can get the most depth of field out of it. Uh, kind of like that B. I'm going to go backwards here real quick. Not that B, but that B. Uh, I aligned myself so that he was basically running across that plane of focus so I could keep almost all of them in focus on that shot. Let's go back forward here. Whereas if I have like this butterfly, its head might be in focus, but really quickly the wings and the butt of this uh, butterfly are going to fall out of focus. So option one is I can start to stop down my aperture. So I can go from 2.8 to f8, and that depth of field is going to grow. Or I can go to f16, and that depth of field is going to grow even more. Do keep in mind your depth of field grows more behind my plane of focus than it does in front of my plane of focus. Uh, so as I'm looking at this subject, I can stop that lens down to f16, increase how much of that uh, subject I can keep in focus. Kind of a very quick uh, and simple example on something we all know the scale of. So we're focused in on uh, Mr. Washington's nose. As we go from 2.8 to 5.6 to f8 to f11, f16, f22, f32. And keep in mind your macro lenses will typically stop down further than other lenses will. Most lenses would have gone to maybe f22. A lot of the macro lenses will give you the capability of going all the way to f32 as a side-by-side -side here, so you can really see the so, uh, significant difference in depth of field uh, by showing 2.8 versus F32. So I can increase that depth of field substantially, right? So what's the problem? The problem typically is that I'm going to lose light. Uh, so this is usually our battle as a photographer is I'm always struggling to have enough light. So if I shoot at 5.6, then I'm at 1 500th of a second. So fast enough to freeze action for my bee on the flower, but my depth of field isn't enough for me to keep both flowers in focus. As I stop down to F22, I'm cutting out a ton of light. So now I'm at 1 30th of a second to achieve this. And that's if I kept the ISO the same. The other alternative is to greatly increase my ISO to make up for uh, getting that shutter speed. Um, and I would say for a lot of the newer generation cameras, this is less of a detriment. Uh, so if you have a camera that you maybe bought new in the last, I would say, three to five years, it's probably going to be okay pushing that ISO up quite a bit higher. The Trade-off is if I have an older generation camera, which may be topped out at 6,400 ISO or 3,200 ISO, when I boost that ISO up, it's going to fall apart very, very quickly. And so I'm going to lose a lot of image quality to uh, go this route. Uh, but the newer gen cameras, like I said, the high ISO performance is so much better. A lot of times I'll push my ISO as high as I can to accommodate that. That way I can still keep a faster shutter speed. The second alternative to increase our depth of field is simply to move myself further from my subject. So shooting at the same aperture, if I just simply back up a little bit further, so I'm not as close to my subject, then that depth of field grows. So this is where the strength of a high megapixel camera comes into play, because I can actually take a little bit further back, get more depth of field, and then crop with that uh, megapixel advantage that I have in the new camera. Just to kind of showcase, this is at F11 from about two feet away from my subject. And you can see from the middle of the flower all the way out to the petals, we have a lot of detail, everything kind of in focus. If I went and shot a similar shot from center of the flower, more outwards towards the petals, you can see how quickly 
that depth of field falls off. So I have some detail and a lot of sharpness in parts of this, but there's a lot of it that even just, you know, maybe a quarter of an inch away, not even that, is already starting to fall off and soften up quite a bit. So by changing how close I get to my subject, I can increase that depth of field, or by stopping down my aperture, I can increase that depth of field. There's not really a right answer or a perfect answer here. It's just whatever's going to work for your subject and for your shooting style. So I actually do have a question for you now, if you're ready. Yeah, fair away. Okay, so someone that was curious, uh, can actually explain in more detail why setting the range of focus is useful. Is it about finer control of the focus, limiting hunting, if using autofocus or something else? Um, yes. So if I'm using autofocus, it's really just uh, limiting the range that lens has to work in. So it will be faster to focus because it doesn't have to cover the whole range. And it will also reduce how much it hunts. Um, so the newer generation lenses, this is, I guess, maybe slightly less of a problem because they are faster with the newer uh, focus motors in them. But Macro lenses in general are still fairly slow by comparison to a lot of other lenses. Um, so by, yeah, by limiting that, that focal uh, range that it's trying to look in or that uh, focus distance it's trying to look at, it's just speeding up the process for the lens. Uh, so my focus will be faster uh, and it will be um, just easier for uh, the operation there. I'd say this is more crucial if I'm doing extremes. So if I'm going to be photographing something up close and I know I'm photographing something up close, then I'd like to limit it to just that up close distance. And then what this tells me is when I go to focus, especially if I'm using uh, autofocus, if the lens can't focus, I know right away I'm too close uh, or I'm too far. And then I can start to adjust my location to the subject for that. On the flip side, if I'm shooting a portrait, I don't want macro. I'm not going to be that close to my subject, so I don't need that range on the lens either. So I can limit it to just what I'm going to use. All right. Uh, two quick things. One, your audio is popping in and out a little bit, but the next question for you, uh, do you have any pictures of the typical light diffuser that you mentioned? Um, I do not. Um, so the light diffuser, you guys have, they have them in the store. They're a little uh, basically folded up disc. And then when you pull them out of the, the holder, they kind of can explode up into like a bigger disc. Uh, but they're super light. They don't weigh hardly anything. So you can easily hold it with one hand and still operate your camera. Um, <laughs> we'll pull up a picture of it at the end of the class, though. I'll jump on the camera company website. I'm sure you have pictures of them there. And if my audio is popping in and out, it is probably the Wi-Fi that I'm on right now. So let's see if I can maybe remedy that while I keep talking. Hopefully I don't lose you guys here in the mix of adjusting this, but all right, I'm going to keep going. You still there with me, right? We're still here. Okay, good. I was going to say, hopefully I didn't lose you guys there. All right. Uh, but I will pull up an image of the uh, reflector discs at the end of the class so you guys can see them. And if anyone sees my camera, I actually have a, it's not a diffuser, but it's about this size here. It just pulls up and about that size there. Yeah, so those, uh, and you can get some of them that are tiny, that are maybe uh, like six inches across when they're all folded up. And those I find are great because I can just clip it onto the outside of my bag and away I go. So, But I would say if you do buy one of the little pop-up diffusers, buy the ones that come uh, with multiple tones or uh, basically different uh, reflector styles because, like I said, you can make use of those ones you're also not using at the same time. All right. So as we get into manual focus options, there's some different pieces in terms of camera settings that we can adjust. Uh, the first one being using focus peaking. This is really nice if I'm doing close-up photography, especially if I'm doing like product or flowers, things like that that aren't moving or running away on me. 
This is nicely that I can manually focus and I'm just going to follow that color accent as it moves around in my image and then I know exactly where my focus plane is going to fall on my subject. If you want to use this option, if you go into your menu and depending what camera you have, this is going to be located in a slightly different spot, uh, but it's usually within um, your, so like on the new A7 IV, it'll be in your autofocus menu. And then you'll have a focus assist or focus assistant option, and it'll be in there. Uh, if you have like an A7 III or a 6400, your uh, menu will look like the one on the left here. And in here, you're going to go to um, that first camera tab, and it's usually about halfway to the last like half or last quarter of the pages. But you'll have one that says, again, focus assistant. And in here, you're going to have focus peaking settings. The first thing we want to do is make sure that our focus peaking display is turned on. And then when we go into a manual focus mode, that uh, color will display on the back of the camera. Peaking level, you can adjust. I like to leave this at mid. I find low is usually almost too thin of a display and um, high is too wide of a display. So it's tough for me to see where focus is falling. And then you can adjust the color based on the subject we're photographing. A little cheat code here. Uh, if you shoot raw, what I usually will do is I will set my color in the camera to be black and white. And then I can set that peaking color to be red. And then as I'm photographing my subject, uh, it's displaying in the camera as black and white. But now I can watch that red line come back and forth, and it's much quicker for me to manually focus. Another piece that's very helpful for macro photography is focus magnifier. Uh, by default, it's set up so the, the camera rather is set up so that if I go into manual focus and I start adjusting the focus, the cameras are automatically going to magnify what I'm looking at. Uh, so makes it really easy for me, especially if I'm on a tripod. I like this. If I'm going to try and do handheld and do some macro, then I prefer to uh, disable this feature because I find it's almost more difficult for me. I don't know exactly where the camera is aiming at when it decides to magnify. So if you decide to uh, disable this feature, in that same menu with our focus uh, peaking settings, you'll have an option that says manual focus assist. Turn this off if you do not want that on. So if you don't want it to automatically do this, turn that off. And then you can actually set focus magnifier as a custom button on the camera and use it at, uh, at your own desire. Which kind of leads us right into setting custom buttons. Almost every single button on the camera is customizable. So you can actually go in here and fine tune how you want the camera to operate. And if you have the 50 millimeter macro or the 90 millimeter macro from Sony, they also have a button on the lens, which is customizable as well. So again, depending on kind of the camera menu that we have, uh, the previous generation, of cameras is what's on here right now. Uh, this will be in camera tab number two, and it's typically the last or second to last page. And you will have uh, custom key settings for both stills, video, or for playback. If you're using a, a newer camera like the a7 IV or an R5 Alpha 1, this is gonna actually be in the yellow setup tab and you'll have an operation customization uh, option. And then you'll find the same custom key settings within that spot. Uh, but to set a custom button, we just go into that setting and it'll actually, whoops, show you here on the side. On the right side, you'll see, um, basically it'll show you a map of the camera. And then as we toggle through the buttons, they will kind of highlight on the camera. So I can go through and I can set all the different buttons and what I want them to do. Some of the buttons that I actually like to set up on the camera for macro photography, the center button is kind of this back middle button uh, on the little thumb pad on the back of the camera. I like to set that as my focus magnifier. 
then I can just kind of one quick press uh, if I'm in a manual focus mode. And it, what it'll do is the first button press will bring up a orange square. And I can move that square wherever I like in the frame. And then I can click again and it will magnify that. And I can click it again and it'll magnify it even more. So it allows me to really punch in close to the subject uh, as I want to. On the lens, I actually like to set the button a lot of times to do a manual focus, autofocus toggle. That way with one button press, I can actually jump into manual focus or autofocus depending on my subject. Some of the other pieces, um, a lot of these are usually by default. Uh, I just am so familiar with them always being there on the cameras, but uh, C1 and C2 are usually up on the top of the camera. And I usually will set these as autofocus area and autofocus mode. On the previous generation cameras, like the A7 III, A7R4, I used to always set the C3 button, which is way over here, as an in-camera guide. If you have an A7 IV, whoops, uh, A7 IV or a R5, this is already built into the camera, so you don't need that as a custom button anymore. So you can set that as something totally different if you'd like. On the left of the thumb pad, you also have your different drive mode. So if I want to do a burst of photos, things like that, I can do that. If you have the A7R5 in your drive mode options here, you actually have a bracketing for focus, uh, which is a very cool thing. Uh, so you can focus bracket in that camera as well. Um, otherwise, a lot of these are by default. So right is ISO. Uh, down, I set as white balance, just so I can have quicker access to it. The function menu is also customizable. So when we press that function button on the back of the camera, you're greeted with, uh, by default, usually the six most popular pieces on the camera. You can go in and change all of these as well. So this might be putting things like the focus peaking option on here you might decide to have uh, the adjustment between manual focus and autofocus on here as well. Uh, you can turn stabilization on or off, a bunch of these different pieces. This is found in the same spot as that custom uh, key setting. So after you're done setting up your custom buttons, go through and set up the function menu the way you want it as well. Again, different things that I usually will put on here steady shot on and off um, creative style this is what allows me to really quickly switch between black and white and color and then that way when I use focused peaking if I'm shooting raw uh, the focus peaking really pops on that black and white and then when I load it into like Lightroom or something like that later uh, since it's raw that black and white file will convert back to color um, you can also set the peaking color as a function menu piece. That way, if I'm at like a botanical garden and I'm photographing a red flower, and then the next moment I'm photographing a yellow flower, I can adjust that peaking color based on my subject really quickly. Uh, the ability to turn grid lines on and off just helps with composition. So I can actually have the rule of thirds uh, grid lines up if I'd like. And then the ability to toggle my flash settings if I use off-camera flash is also kind of nice to have here. In-camera stabilization is a feature that's uh, pretty common in most of the cameras now. The advantage here is if I'm handheld, it, it's going to give a lot of correction. So it's going to do pitch, yaw, roll plus X and Y correction, which basically just uh, mitigates my shake. If I'm on a tripod and I'm shooting slower shutter speeds, I would say slower than like one twentieth of a second or so, uh, this is where I would turn that stabilization off. But as a quick side-by-side -side here, stabilization on, nice sharp image. Uh, me after three cups of coffee with stabilization off, shaky image. Uh, so that's just kind of the benefit that we all already know uh, that stabilization brings to the table. All right, so to give you guys some different uh, ideas in terms of how to photograph while shooting macro, um, these are just kind of the different techniques that I use based on if I'm using a tripod or if I'm doing handheld macro. Um, and these are some of the things that if you swing by the store on Friday, 
you can also play around and practice a little bit with this too. So if I'm photographing a moving subject and I'm on a tripod, so this might be flowers that are out in the field. So windy day and the flowers are kind of blowing back and forth. Uh, this might be something like a bee on a flower or something like that. I want to have the camera into AFC or continuous autofocus. And then I like to have the focus area on the newer cameras be set to tracking plus flexible spot small. Having it in flexible spot small allows me to put kind of a pinpoint of focus on where exactly I want the camera to look and focus. And then while it's on tracking, I can actually press halfway down. And if I'm on a B, it focuses on my B. If that B starts flying away, as long as I'm holding halfway down, the focus will re-engage and follow that B. If I am shooting a subject that's not moving, so let's say I'm in the house and I'm photographing coins to sell on eBay or something like that. Then I will set the camera to be in manual focus uh, because my subject's not moving anywhere. I'm on a tripod. I'm not moving anywhere. I can be in manual focus. I want to make sure I have my focus peaking turned on and a color that's going to pop from my subject. Uh, this way, as I manually focus, I can really easily see where focus is falling on my subject. For drive mode, I want to just be in single shot. So every press of the shutter button is going to take one picture. And if possible, I want to use a cabled remote or maybe my phone just so I'm not adding any movement to the camera while it's on the tripod. Self-timer, if you're like me and left your shutter release cable back at home. And then we'll turn steady shot off. Uh, because we're going to be on a tripod, we're already stable, it shouldn't be uh, adding anything for us anyway. So this would be, if I'm on a tripod, these are kind of the two different setups that I use for photographing on a tripod. Now, there's a lot of times where I don't have my tripod with me, but I need to kind of crawl into a weird space to get access to the subject I want to photograph, right? Um, oh, and I should point this out. So as I'm on the tripod, Kind of the way I compose my subject then is I want to um, basically move my lens or move my whole camera, if you will, tripod and all, uh, closer to my subject. And one thing that I do with manual focus here. So if I'm on manual focus, I will set this to the focus range I want. So let's say it's one-to-one -one magnification, right? So initially, everything's going to look kind of blurry. And I want to move that until my subject comes nice and sharp on the screen. So I can start moving the tripod closer. I can, if I'm photographing a coin at home, I can start moving that coin closer to me um, so that it comes sharper onto the screen. Now, every now and then we're gonna shoot handheld. Like I said, I either have to get into a weird spot or I have to shoot at a weird angle and the tripod's not gonna be helpful in that nature. So if I need, to shoot handheld. First option again, moving subject. Let's say I'm photographing frogs or bugs or something like that. Again, I want to use the lock on or the tracking area and flexible spots small typically, just so again, I can be very precise with where my focus is going. And sometimes I will use manual focus for this. Um, and there's a different technique for this at the very end. So bear with me here a moment. But sometimes I'll use manual focus if it's something that's not moving, right? If I'm photographing maybe flowers or trees, uh, tree leaves, something like that. Focus peaking again on and a color that's going to stand out from my subject. I want to set the camera to be in a burst mode. So as I press the shutter button down, it's going to take a number of photos. I want steady shot on because I'm not on a tripod, I'm handheld, so I need the extra assistance from steady shot. But now here's the difference is as I'm going to take my picture, uh, especially when we get heavily magnified with macro, we tend to lean more or rock more, so frontwards and backwards. So what I want to do, even if I'm in manual focus, I'm photographing flowers, as I press that shutter button, I'm just going to hold down for a moment and take a burst of photos because inevitably I'm either going to lean forward into the flowers or the wind is going to pick up and that flower is going to 
maybe drift a little bit in my frame. But by shooting a burst of photos, I'm going to have three or four options. I can then look through those and pick the one that I prefer in terms of where focus actually fell. So again, if I'm manual focused, handheld, I want to get as close to my subject as I can comfortably. Focus in, burst mode, hold down the shutter button. And as I kind of lean into my shot, hold that burst through the lean. Okay, Ashley, can I interrupt you for a second? Absolutely. Okay, a couple of quick questions. Um, uh, focus peaking, that's not just a Sony thing, but it's a mirrorless camera thing. So uh, uh, they have a Canon 90D. Uh, because it's a DSLR, you would not have focus peaking on that, correct? Correct. Next question for you. Um, could you remind us the advantage of switching off the stabilization when the camera's mounted on a tripod? Tripod. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the in-body stabilization is going to react to movement. Um, so if I'm on a tripod, there shouldn't be any movement. But the problem is, and this has gotten better in the newer generation of cameras, uh, but the some of the older cameras, uh, even the lens stabilization, if I had any kind of like micro vibration happening in the tripod legs, sometimes it would sense that and it would start activating stabilization and I don't need it. So it ends up adding movement or blur to my image because that optic is moving while I'm taking my picture. So ideally, if I'm on a tripod, I shouldn't have any movement anyway, so I can turn stabilization off. Okay. And last question that you probably can answer after everything, uh, macro videography, but I'll sure. talk about your presentation. Um, so this is actually uh, something that I've just kind of started dabbling with and playing with um, as I'm getting more and more into video. And uh, macro videography is one of those things that is very underserved. There's not a whole lot of people out there that do it. Um, and it's, it's tricky because you have such a shallow depth of field to work with too. So you do have to be pretty uh, meticulous on your subjects. Um, but in terms of a lot of video settings, I would say you're going the same route you normally would. So I'm trying to set for some of my higher quality video. I want to make sure I have memory cards that are fast enough to keep up with that higher quality video. Um, I would say the 90 millimeter macro is ideal for if you're do doing video just because it gets you that working distance. Uh, so that I can get um, myself out of the shot as much as possible as well. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so real quick, we'll just kind of uh, touch on some of the composition stuff here. Um, so the first thing is backgrounds and borders. Regardless if we're doing video or stills, we need to be very meticulous on what we're including in our image. And with any subject, especially I find with macro, because we're so hyper focused on this tiny little subject and making sure they're in focus and as much focus as possible we really stop paying attention to what's going on on the edge of our frame and what's going on in the background of our frame so something like this you know i'm so focused on this flower i kind of don't even see the uh, one that's just starting to open up in the background but it's kind of a distraction in the background easily avoidable if i catch it at the time right i can just change my my position or actually what's even easier with macro is I can just take a stick and I can just push that one out of the way uh, and it's not even in my frame anymore. But ideally aiming for nice clean backgrounds that way it keeps the focus on our subject that way our viewer is kind of locked in and watching our subject as well. So again nice clean backgrounds and you, you can see just how razor thin that plane of focus is we kind of talked about this earlier so like this is at 2.8 and you can see like even the tip of the wing just fractions of an inch is enough to throw that out of focus so you a lot of you guys were from uh, uh wisconsin i'm from minnesota which means that for two-thirds of the year we can't go outside so i still I like to photograph flowers and I still like to have interesting backgrounds when I photograph flowers. I don't want everything to be like a seamless paper backdrop, right? So how can I photograph stuff inside my house but have it look unique? 
or even if I'm out in the field and maybe my background for a flower or something I want to photograph just looks ugly. Uh, there's ways that we can overcome this. The easiest way, this summer you guys are going to have homework to do. And that is when you go photograph something cool like this, a nice little like landscape shot, photograph it like this, kind of get your landscape shot the way you want it. But then also take your lens, put it into manual focus, and turn it all the way so everything gets defocused and looks something like this. So I want to actually photograph this as well and save this image. Because what we're going to do is we're then going to go to camera company and we're going to have them print this for me. And you're thinking, what? But yes, I want to print this image. And if I'm going to use this at home, I probably want to print it fairly big, like 11 by 14 or something like that. The advantage is now I can go home, I can get my flowers, and I can have this image printed and put on like a little foam core so it's stiff and sturdy. But now I can capture natural backgrounds so they don't look like a fake just blob of color from Photoshop. It's actually a natural occurring background. So the colors are natural looking, things like that. And then I just light my subject to match the scene. So the nice advantage here is I can get these nice natural backgrounds. I can use things like this as my backdrop and put my flower in front of it, things like that. But now I can photograph in my kitchen in the middle of winter and still get nice images out of it. I would say that there's two different styles I do with this. The one that you see in there are the ones that I would take as my portable. So if I go out in the field, so they're just on a foam core, uh, matte finish print, and they're about an eight by 12 size, but then they fit in the laptop slot on my backpack. So then as I'm out walking around, they're safe and protected, but then I can pull them out and I can just drop it behind a flower if I'm out in the field and get a nice natural looking backdrop. Whereas maybe I have something like uh, that previous flower we looked at, where there's just a ton of other busy stuff going on in the background. I can now put this in there and kind of create my own background. In terms of composition, uh, some of the fun stuff, I always love using rule of thirds. I find that it works incredibly well um, for keeping interest in a photo by stacking my subject on one of those intersecting thirds. Ideally, the spot that I want to draw my viewer's eye to is going to be on one of those intersecting thirds. So a lot of times we'll shoot photos where my subject is on one of those third lines, and then I have just kind of negative space for you to drift and then come right back to the subject. Uh, sometimes filling the frame is the way to go. Uh, I promise this fly was dead when I found him. This was not from my doing. Uh, but filling the frame, uh, if I have something that's really not moving like this guy, I can get very, 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 very close and fill the frame with that subject. When we photograph certain things like butterflies, uh, trying to get parallel with them is the ideal because then I can keep as much of them in focus as easily as possible. So quickly, I'm just gonna kind of walk through a series of images. Um, basically starting out like this one where it's just blah, really nothing. And initially, you guys are probably the same way as me. When I start taking pictures for the day, I can guarantee the first bunch of them are going to be terrible and I'm not going to like them. And typically, I have to get kind of those creative juices flowing. So the first shot usually is something like this where I walk up and I photograph it. And then I look at it and I go, eh, whatever. And I start kind of walking away. Uh, force yourself to really work the subject though. So we take the first picture. We're not impressed with it. Let's try a different angle. Something that maybe adds a little bit more character, a little bit more creativity to the image. Try getting closer to the subject. And this is the difference. Uh, if you look at this with the bright sun and kind of the harsh shadows versus me holding a reflector disc over it. So it just really softens all that light and keeps it a nice flat light. It's just diffusing all that light that's coming through. Changing angles, again, removing the reflector disc, maybe the shadows help, but giving yourself a bunch of options and really giving the subject as much attention as you can. Photograph 
photographing it from a bunch of different points of view, a bunch of different angles, closer, further, all, all of those things to try and build up uh, that image. One more final example on this. Uh, so photograph these flowers. I thought these flowers were super cool. Uh, so first picture I took, didn't like it. Uh, the background is just too busy. It's too distracting. And unfortunately, even if I shoot this at 2.8, the background is so close, I can't really defocus it enough. So attempt number two, we go on the other side and shoot the other direction. That's a little bit better. The background's a little further separated, so it starts to actually build some separation, build some focus on my main subject. And then getting a little closer and isolating a certain part of the plant, now I can really kind of lose that whole background uh, and really focus on the flower. 